hello there, fellow Force Sensitives, and welcome back to the shop. We're back today with another really fun build, another Iron Man helmet, but this time, moving the ball forward in our technology, we're going to step away from the MCU for a hot second and focus on one of my favorite helms from the Iron Man comics. This one, from The Invincible Iron Man, the most recent run, written by Brian Michael Bendis. Now, I don't go full comic book nerd very often, um, but this is a really good book. I finally had a chance to sit down and do some reading in the midst of all of my various projects um, over the last couple of weeks, and I picked this one up. I had never finished the Civil War II arc. Uh, I'm really interested in the characters of Riri Williams' Ironheart and the in infamous Iron Man version of Doctor Doom. They're super cool characters, and so I wanted to really sink my teeth into those, and I decided this was the next helm I wanted to build. Now, Minor spoiler alert for those of you who have not read this comic book run, specifically the infamous Iron Man, um, which I highly recommend. Doctor Doom decides to turn over a new leaf and become a hero after Tony Stark's apparent death at the end of the Civil War II arc. When he does so, he breaks into Tony's lab and takes a an, an iteration, a version, of the Invincible Iron Man helmet, the Model Prime. Uh, this is what we're building here. Dr. Doom's infamous Model Prime. I'm going to break this video down into two parts. The last one, the Mark 25, was a bit long. Uh, ran over an hour. That was my first video that went that long. And I want to make it a little more digestible and easier for you guys to see what we do. So we're going to break this one down into two parts. The first one is going to deal with the helmet itself. And then part two is going to deal with the electronics. Uh, and we're doing some new and exciting things with that. So I think you're really going to enjoy these videos. Um, stay tuned. Here we go. All right, so as you can see, I've already gone a little bit into the build for this uh, particular helm. I've done the printing, I've done the tacking with super glue, I have done the interior stitching, uh, all these things you can see in earlier videos, specifically the Mark 41 um, and the Mark 25. I'll leave links for those in the description, or you can find them in the uh, Sith Smithery playlist. Um, I have also gone ahead and uh, sanded the crap out of this thing and applied the paint. And in this case, for the helm itself, I used soft flat iron. Came out really, really good. This is a metallic spray. Um, it's not quite catching the light here like it does in the sun, but it is very metallic and reflective. Uh, for the faceplate, I used dark steel, which you know you would think would be darker than the soft flat iron, but it's not. It is a beautiful mirror chrome finish, and it catches the light wonderfully. I really love this helm. It was designed by Jace, um, just like the Mark 41 helm that I did, and I will link, of course, to the, the 3D files in the, in the description below. Uh, but the angles on this thing are really evocative of the comic. I love the way that the jaw and uh, the cheekbones are structured in, and it's, it's a really smooth, flat helm, but it's got these awesome angles built in, and I, yeah, I really am enjoying how this looks so far. So we're gonna Dr. Doom this thing up. Another thing that I've done uh, is I went ahead and foam sealed the junction between the faceplate and the helm. And for this, in the Mark 25, I did this uh, using this premium rubber weather stripping from Frost King. Uh, I picked that up at the Home Depot, I believe. And that worked really well. In fact, I think this might be my superior favorite choice. However, in this model, just to try something new, um, I tried another uh, product that they make, this rubber foam. Uh, and, and it's cool. It actually has better compression qualities than the hard rubber. Uh, but you know, I just like the hard rubber a little better. It actually, this, this softer foam tends to stick to the faceplate a little more than the harder rubber. Um, so yeah, I think I'm going to go back to the other one in future iterations. But for this build, I used the soft, and it's working just fine. Um, I also went ahead and put my padding into the helmet, um, and I wanted it to be removable. So I put Velcro strips in and uh, Velcroed the back of these pieces of foam. And what I basically did was I have a big block of foam that's just been sitting around in my shop, and I cut it into strips with some scissors. Uh, I found some Velcro, long Velcro, I can put a link to where you can find this online. It comes in, of course, both sides that stick together, and I cut it to length and hot glued it to the foam so that it would not come off. Nice car alarm. 
Okay, my neighbor's car has stopped having a panic attack. So let's continue with what we're gonna do next. Um, we are going to work on the faceplate and how it attaches to the helm. Um, on the faceplate itself, I got these amazing green, very Dr. Doomy reflective um, sunglasses from a company called Rex. I will leave a link for that in the description. And you know, I'll be honest with you, these are amazing glasses. I almost hate to take them apart. They are super bendy and they're made to flex and not shatter. And I love that. Um, that being said, I am gonna destroy them and put them into my faceplate because these are the lenses I wanna use. Uh, I am also going to attach magnet lock systems. Um, previously in the Mark 25, I used, I, I designed this little file to hold a magnet on one side and to be connected to the helm on the other side. So the faceplate had a magnet in it that snap locked on. In um, this one, I'm gonna actually use two magnets and I've designed another file here that has a little, little section there in the middle. Uh, this is going to attach to the back to hold the magnets and this is going to attach to the inside of the helm and my rubber seal will uh, lay on that little notch there. So I will actually put these files um, online. Probably I'll upload them to Thingiverse and then I will share those with you in the description below if you want to use these in your helm designs. Uh, they work for me. I, I, I love how a lot of people online are motorizing the helmets but I really like the magnet lock. As for the magnets themselves, these come in a 12 pack. They're neodymium ring magnets. Um, yeah, and they're really got a, a nice low profile and they're super strong. These things will uh, jump together from a couple of good inches away. So I like these a lot. All right, lenses are installed. That looks really sick. That is definitely a nice Dr. Doom green. Back side of the faceplate, essentially what I've done is take my Dremel and cut the pieces uh, that I don't want away from my sunglasses. I kept the lenses in the frames in order to have a good strong mounting point and to hold the lenses intact. And then I just went around with hot glue and hot glued those suckers right to the faceplate. So that's pretty permanent, pretty airtight solution. Ready to move on to the next step. Okay, so next up, this step is also pretty easy. I like to switch to the Gorilla Super Glue, just the normal kind, it holds pretty well. Um, put a little drizzle on the bottom of each of the socket sections, and then what you want, the only trick is to make sure that your magnets stay same side up. So slide off, face down, slide off, face down. Ooh, and if they stick together, just start again. <laughs> slide off, face down, keep them a little further apart. Slide off face down. So both of the same um, polarities are facing up and you wanna keep that consistent with all of your magnet mounts. So it just takes a tiny dab of glue on the back end and these sockets are made to pretty much press fit in the magnet. I'm gonna go ahead and do one at a time. Let it dry, super glue dries really quickly but you want the first one to be really solidly mounted before you put the next one right next to it so that they don't um, have any interaction with each other magnetically. Okay, so now we're gonna place our magnets on the back side of our faceplate to line up with our mag magnets that are gonna lock into the helm. So we're gonna take a pencil here and mark out both sides of the magnet mount. Okay, and then I'm going to take my calipers and measure out the center to center of both magnets and we'll come back to my lock here estimate about where those should go and put a little red dot to mark out those distances on the faceplate we're going to do the same thing on the other side okay now that we have our marks we want to take some more magnets and lay them out so that they lock with the proper polarity to our faceplate. So now you know this side is gonna go down on the faceplate. So I'm gonna grab that with my thumb and I'm gonna flip it down. I'll grab the other one with my thumb, flip it down. So the downsides are gonna go onto my faceplate. Okay, again, putting these magnets really close together before this glue is dry, you're gonna have a magnetic interaction and one's gonna jump over the other. So you wanna go ahead and do one on each side and let that dry before you assemble the other for each side. Right, now that we've got two magnets set on each side of the faceplate, uh, the next thing we want to do is glue the back of these to the front side. You see the notch 
is facing up to the front side of this, and you probably want to take it all the way out about as far as you think it might need to go. And we're going to do that for two of these locks. All right, so the next thing we want to do is position our faceplate on the helmet. Get it in there right where you want it to go. And how you want it to sit. All right, now we're gonna flip it over and work on the un underside of the helmet. We're going to take our magnets, lock it to the magnets, and glue this circle to the inside of the helmet where it should sit so that everything's lined up properly. Cool, so I went ahead and tacked mine with some super glue and then I went and reinforced it with hot glue to make sure that that thing stays in place for all time. I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side. All right, we're feeling pretty solid. Faceplate is sitting pretty. It's very well attached just with those two locks. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop it by sliding it forward. Oh my goodness, that is a strong lock. Wow. Okay, and then the next thing I wanna do, you may have noticed that I made four of these and not just two. Um, I want to atta uh, attach them on the inside of the helm so that in addition to locking normally, the faceplate can also sit up like this. So I'm gonna place this the way that I want it and I'm going to reach around on the other side and find where those magnets are sitting and apply my locks through the PLA. Let's do that on both sides. Awesome. That's an okay lock. I'm pretty happy with that. So I'm gonna go ahead and hot glue those in where they're sitting so that I can have the faceplate sit in either orientation. Oh yeah, that is some sweet, sweet clamp magnet goodness. I'm pleased. I did add two more magnets at the top of the faceplate and two more magnets back inside the, the uh, helm itself because it just sticks better that way. But I think I'm happy with the result. And of course the main lock is perfect. Okay, as if that were not enough magnets, I actually popped one more in here. Um, I've taken the central padding piece out so that you can get a good look at it. It is mounted right up there just in the fore of that padding Velcro strip. And this is actually just so I can connect a hood and keep a hood up over it like when I'm in strong winds or riding my bike. So you can see this piece, this magnet here, this ceramic magnet is what I will put on top of the hood that will pin it to the helm when I'm wearing a hood over the helm because, you know, Dr. Doom likes his hoods. Okay, so there's one more piece I, I want to work on here for the structure of the Model Prime helm for Dr. Doom, and that has to do with this, this little divot here, this detail of this triangle. I love it, um, and I initially was going to try to make this, and I still am within bounds, like minimal electronics for this helmet, um, but I'm going to put a light in there because I just think that this little divot is calling for some sort of extra detail, and it also gives me an opportunity to make something else in the same color, some sort of accent piece in the same color of the faceplate to highlight both of those and just to make the whole thing pop. So I'm gonna do that. I'm going to actually design this. And since we've broken this video down into two parts, we've got a little more time here in the structural assembly um, phase. And I'm gonna show you how I do what I do. Um, hopefully it will inspire some of you out there who have not designed your own things um, yet to do so, to take a stab at it. This is a pretty simple piece, um, so we should be able to walk through this pretty quickly and show you just how easy it can be to make something out of your mind into something in real life. So here we go. Okay, so I've got out my design laptop here, um, and I specifically wanted to do this work on this laptop because it is um, cheap. This is a Dell that I got for, I think, $100 refurbished a while, oh, maybe three or four years ago when um, when my functional laptop crashed and I needed something quick in a pinch. Um, 
When I bought this laptop, it had Windows 10 on it. It, it was only, it, I think it only has a 40 gigabyte internal hard drive and Windows 10 took up like most of that hard drive. So of course I put a Linux operating system on it to uh, to take advantage of that space because uh, Ubuntu, for example, would, I think this is running yeah, 16.04, uh, only takes up like a gig and a half of space, so suddenly you've got a functional hard drive again on a very uh, inexpensive refurbished computer. So I wanted to show you guys that not only is this possible, it's doable on the cheap. You don't need fancy hardware, you don't need an amazing computer to do these things. It's nice, uh, and it's cool to have things render quickly, but you can do it on the bare bones. So you can use pretty much any software suite that you prefer to design 3D models, um, 3D files. Um, I use Blender. Blender is uh, free, it's pretty easy learning curve to get a handle on, and it works on Macs, it works on PC desktops, and it works on Linux. Um, you could use SolidWorks, you could use Google SketchUp. Uh, there are a number of programs out there that let you create 3D meshes and um, export them to either .stl or .obj formats. And either one of those formats works just fine, um, that you can take your 3D file and load it up in a slicing program. In my case, I use Cura, uh, and I'll walk you through all of this here in this video. Um, and you can slice your file for your particular 3D printer. So you're gonna need two things. You're gonna need a design program, where I'm using Blender, and you're gonna need a slicing program for your for your printer, and in which case I'm using Cura. So if you wanna use Blender and you don't have it already, if you're on a Mac or on a PC, just go to blender.org, uh, download the software application, and install it in the normal way that you would normally install software. Uh, if you're on Linux, things get even easier. What you do is Control-Alt-T to open up a terminal. I'll make that big screen. And what you want to type here is sudo. And again, sudo will give you root privileges and allow you to make changes to your computer. So sudo apt hyphen get install blender. Um, I already have Blender, so I'm not going to hit enter here, but if I didn't and I hit uh, enter, it would ask me, it would it would check my repositories, it would find the specifically the right um, Blender uh, suite for this com particular computer that I'm running, uh, using data from the computer itself. Uh, it would tell me how much uh, uh, memory it will take to install the program, and it will ask me if I wanted to go forward. I'll hit the yes button, and it will install it all automatically through code here in the terminal. I like to do it that way. Um, it saves me the trouble of looking for, this is a 32-bit computer like I mentioned, most of the new Blender programs are made for 64-bit computers, um, so you find exactly what you need from the repository that you already have set up to work with this system. So I like to do it that way, um, you'd hit enter if you wanted to do that, I'm going to let this go because I've already got it, and just open up Blender. Alright, and I'm going to make this full screen. So when you open Blender, you see that there's a cube already here, um, and that's great for, for this particular design. I'm going to use <laughs> a cube to make the part that I want. If there were not a cube already here, or if there was a different design that you're looking for, what you want to go down here to add and open up the mesh menu, and you have a variety of options um, in the mesh menu. You've got a plane, a cube, a circle, uh, a, a sphere, uh, different kinds of spheres actually. You can do low poly or high poly. Uh, a cylinder, a cone, or a torus. And using those shapes, you can pretty much make whatever shape you're looking for by, uh, if you want, for example, a donut, you've got your torus, but if you only wanted a half of a donut, you'd bring out a torus and cut it in half. And that's kind of what we're gonna do here. Uh, I'm gonna start with this cube, and I'm gonna make it into a, uh, a rectangle, um, and then I'm gonna cut it in half to make my triangle shape. So let's walk through that process here. There are a couple of different ways you can do it. Um, when you've got your cube, you see right now it's set in the orientation mode where I can move this thing around by uh, using these arrows to bring it up or down, left or right, or forward or back uh, in the three-dimensional space here. And you can see it's set against a plane uh, for orientation here in the software suite. Um, down here I have other options. I can also rotate instead of move. You've got your move options with the arrows. I can rotate and it will give you these circles that you can drag and turn the thing around in any dimension to get it any orientation that you want. Uh, finally, there's a sizing tool here that you can see with these little uh, boxes instead of arrows at the end of each line. And if I take one of these and drag it, I can increase or decrease the size of that cube 
um, in any orientation, any direction that I want. Now, before I start to work with this, and I'm actually not going to do it this way, but I wanted to show you that that is a way you could do it if you wanted to do it freestyle and just make a shape visually based on proportions that you like. Um, in this case, I want to make a, a pretty equilateral triangle here for the helm. So I want to keep my proportions uh, pretty precise. So I'm going to actually type in the, uh, the numbers to make it work that way instead of visually uh, orienting how I want it to look d in a design fashion. But you can do it either way. Um, and before I do, what I want to do is change the view. So I want to look at this cube from the top down. So I'm going to go over to View and click on Top. And instead of 3D orientation, now I'm looking directly down on top of this cube. Um, I'm going to take it back out of sizing mode and put it into uh, uh, move mode so that I don't accidentally uh, change any of, the orient uh, any of the variables manually. The next thing I want to do is uh, left click on the cube itself so that the uh, outline goes from orange to yellow and when it's yellow that means I've selected the cube uh, and then I'm going to go over here to the side and click scale. When I do that I will get uh, a vector here in my sidebar and I've got an X dimension, a Y dimension, and a Z dimension and what we're going to do here since we're scaling is right now it's set at zero for each I'm going to go ahead and click in here actually it's set at one but um, since I moved my mouse, it defaulted down to like 0.977, but that's all right. Uh, what I want to do is essentially make it bigger by a multiple. So if I were to put two here in this field, it would multiply that dimension, that x-axis, by two, and only that dimension. Um, and then I could do two here in the y to make it a square again. And leave the z at one gives me... Uh, the rectangle shape that I'm kind of looking for. Now, I want my rectangle to be even bigger than that compared to the height of that. So instead of two, I'm going to go back in here again, and I'm going to do five and five, and I'm going to leave this at one. Okay, now that I've done that, I'm going to click back down here on any of my tools to get out of scale so that I don't continue to manipulate these things on accident by moving my mouse or my cursor. Um, and I'm going to change my view again to left or right or back or front so that you can see the difference here. Now I actually still want this to be even uh, even, even wider than it is tall. So I'm going to go back into scale again. Uh, let's view at the top first. And we'll go back into scale. And now that we've already made it uh, five times wider in, in both the x and y axis, I'm only going to make it to two times from here because that will equal 10. And we'll leave this at 1 for the z-axis for height. Again, I'm going to click out of this tool. And let's go to left or right. or back. Let's do back this time. They're all the same when you're dealing with this particular shape. So I like this a little bit better, my width versus my height. And my width, depending on uh, it, it, my x and my y, are the same because it is a... Uh, a cube here, or at least a cube-shaped rectangle, if you're looking at it from the top. Um, so again, I'm going to go back to my top view. Okay, and now what I want to do is cut this in half so that I get a triangle shape instead of uh, the rectangle shape that we have. Um, in order to do that, I'm going to make sure that I'm clicked on it again with the, the left click button, or sorry, the right click button. Um, and then down here where it says object mode, I'm going to change that to edit mode. And when I do, it's going to show you, and this isn't a great example actually. Um, here, let's go back into view left. Now, it's a cube, so or it's a rectangle, so you can't really see. But if this were a more complicated mesh, this would show you the mesh pattern itself when you're looking at it in edit mode. Um, you can see all the different grid lines that connect all the different facets of your, your object file that you're working with. This is pretty straightforward. There's only just edges around the side of each plane. Um, so what I want to do now that I'm in edit mode is go to the bottom of my options here in this menu. This menu changes when you go into edit mode. And I'm going to find bisect. Once I've clicked bisect, my cursor becomes this little crosshairs. And I want to essentially start at one corner and draw a line to the opposite corner. OK, once that line is set, the next thing I'm going to do is pull the second uh, bar down to the bottom. And I have some options here that say fill, um, clear inner, and clear outer. Now in this case, my inner and my outer are identical, so it doesn't matter which one I clear. But I do want to click the fill button, which will back fill in the face of where I'm cutting. 
and that's important. You can go back and do that later in a mesh, but it's easiest to do it while you're bisecting if you want it to be filled in and not hollow. Um, so I'm gonna click fill. I'm gonna click either of these options. And the in this case, the inner, which is on that side of the line, disappears. So now I'm left with this triangle shape that I want. At this point, I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna do file, save as. I'm gonna save this design as a blender file. We're gonna call it um, a triangle dot blend and I'm going to save it here in my prime helm folder where I'm saving all of my other files all right now that I've got it saved as a mesh I need to export it um, as either a dot obj or a dot stl file so we go to file export and I like obj files it really doesn't matter you can pick either that or stl either one of those you're going to be able to work with that in a slicing program so let's go with obj and it says triangle.obj, it's in the right folder, so I'm gonna export. Okay, now the next thing I wanna do, um, since we have bisected this, it, it, it's it got some memory of this file, and I don't want that memory in there to <laughs> to mess with, especially on this low power computer, to mess with um, the, the rendering of my object. So I wanna go back and hit file, and let's see, new and reload startup file. Oops, did, did it do it? There we go. Okay, so now we're back to the beginning. We've got our cube, um, and I don't want this cube anymore. I want to go ahead and right click on it, hit delete, and select delete. It goes away. We've got a clear slate with nothing here. We're gonna go back to file, and we're gonna import in the object file, the .obj that I just created. So I'm gonna go find that in my files here. Triangle, triangle.obj. Okay, and I'm gonna import my obj file. So now we've got it. We're looking at it again in three-dimensional view so you can see that it is the shape that I want it to be. Um, I'm gonna go back to top view for a moment. I'm going to right click on it. You can see it's orange around the outside now and now it turns yellow, which means I've selected it. Okay, what I wanna do next um, is I essentially want it to be hollow, but to have sidewalls and a bottom. And the reason I want to do that is because I'm going to flip it over so that it has a flat top face when it pops in here, uh, and then I can embed a light in the middle of it uh, so that there's room inside this triangle piece for the light to sit um, inside that divot. And I'm going to drill a hole here uh, to let wires go into the helmet so that the wires can connect to my on and off switch and to my battery when we get to the electronic section. So the way to do that in Blender, now that I've selected it, is just, it's really simple. Uh, control C to copy the object, and it will confirm up here that you have copied your selected objects to the buffer, uh, and then Control V, and it says objects pasted from the buffer. So I've got two of these objects, like, directly in the exact same position, so you can only see one of them, but there are two of them there. Um, and one of them is selected. So now that I have one of them selected, what I wanna do is go back into Scale, that again and bring down my vector to 0 0.9, 0 0.9, 0 0.9. All right, now I'm going to look at this from the side. Let's go to left orientation and I'm going to take one of them up. You can see now that there are two of these triangles almost in the exact same orientation. Now that I brought it up a little bit, let's go back to top view. Oh my goodness, I've done something wrong here. Hold on a second. I had my Z uh, constraint axis selected, so that, that didn't work properly. So I'm actually gonna delete that second triangle. I'm gonna go back into my first triangle again. Let's just do this process again. We'll do scale. Oh, whoops, I'm sorry, not yet. We'll do copy and paste. All right, now we'll do scale. And in my vector, I will do 0 0.9, 0 0.9, 0 0.9, and not have a constraint axis. <laughs> All right, we're gonna go into left view. And we're gonna bring that second triangle up just a little bit. And we'll go back to top view to confirm that I've got my, I do not have my orientation properly. For some reason, my Z axis keeps wanting to constrain. Whatever, we'll fix it manually. So I'm gonna bring this down 
and a little bit over like that. So that what my smaller triangle is about in the middle of my bigger triangle. I'm gonna go back to left view and just confirm that I've got it about as high as I want so that there's still gonna be a base when I use this as a cutting tool. And I think I'm gonna take it just a little lower. Cool, okay. So now back to top view because in top view I can see both triangles and I can click on either one of them. Um, I wanna drag this menu open and make it bigger. And I wanna go over here to this wrench button which is a modifier option. It'll let us modify things. And when I do, you'll see that the, 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 um, the shape I've selected right now has a title here, and it's called Cube 001. It's still called a cube because uh, Blender doesn't know that we've made it into a triangle. Blender knew it was a cube when we created it, so that's what it thinks it is. Um, and there are two of them. There's Cube 001, and then if I click on the other one here, that's Cube 000. What I wanna do is subtract the shape cube 001 from cube 000, which will uh, leave me with my side walls and my base and nothing in the middle of cube 000. So I'm using cube 001 as a cutting tool to describe the space I wanna remove. So what I wanna do is click back on cube 000. That's the outside one, the big one. And then I wanna verify that I've got that here in the title that I'm working with the right shape then I'm gonna to go to add modifier, and what we're gonna choose here is Boolean. We're gonna make a Boolean cut, which are pretty fun cuts. So we'll select that. Um, we'll get our menu for Boolean cuts to pop up here. What I wanna do is a differential Boolean cut, and I want to cut against cube 001. Once you've got all that set, that pinkness will go away, which means you're ready to make your cut, and you can click apply. Now that I've made the cut, I'm gonna take select the tool that I was using, the cube 001, and I'm gonna move it away to confirm that cube 000 actually does have the shape that I want. You can see those sidewalls, you can see that it still has a base. Um, so that's confirmed, I can delete cube 001. And just if you wanna see it from different angles to make sure that you've, you've done what you wanted to do, we can make this menu go away again to make it bigger. We can view left. We can make this go up and down so you can see your sidewalls. You can see your base is still intact. So we've basically made the shape that uh, I wanted to do here. Now, you could get more advanced with this. I'm gonna do some of this manually, but let's look at this from the top again. If you wanted to, um, obviously I, I just described what this piece was for. We're gonna put a LED light in it and that LED light is gonna shine out of it. And this uh, absent space, this empty space in the middle is to actually house the LED when I put it onto the helm and, and tuck it in there underneath this faceplate. So we're gonna want a hole there. I'm gonna drill my hole manually because I want it to be exactly the right size for the LED that pops through it. So I'm gonna use a physical drill, a physical drill bit. I'm gonna take my calipers, I'm gonna measure it and make sure that it's perfect after I've printed this part. But if you wanted to get really fancy about this in the design process, or if you were looking to design the part perfectly so that you didn't have to do any of that manual labor, you could. Um, and that would just be by simply making another Boolean cut. Uh, so let's go ahead and view from the left for a moment here, uh, we're gonna add another mesh. In this case, we're gonna add a cylinder. And let's bring our cylinder up so you can see it. Um, we're going to, in this case, I mean, you could do the same thing with the scale and you could make the numbers. You could also uh, put in whatever numbers of, of sizing you wanted that to be. Uh, and, and it comes out in, in, in blender units, but those translate to millimeters. So you can actually decide with your calipers how big you want it to be and program it that way, uh, if, if that's how you wanna work. Uh, in this case, I'm just gonna use this other tool and I'm gonna make it a taller cylinder just so that it's easy for us to see. I'm gonna go back to my orientation tool and I'm gonna move it so that my cylinder is popping right through uh, the piece that we've created. And then I'm gonna go back to my top view and I'm gonna put this guy right in the middle or about thereabouts where we would want that hole to be created. Let's view this, uh, let's go from the front this time. So you can see, I really am piercing this thing with my new cylinder. So just to review here, what we would do, and I'm not gonna go ahead and activate it because like I said, I'm gonna manually drill this. But if you wanted to do it this way, you'd go back into your wrench mode here on the side, you'd select the piece you want to cut, you'd add a modifier, in this case a Boolean one, uh, you would select difference, a differential Boolean, and then you would select that cylinder in order to make that cylinder's space where it's intersecting disappear. 
uh, and subtract it. You'd hit apply and it would give you that shape. I don't want to do that. Like I said, I'm going to drill this manually, so I'm going to make that go away. Uh, I am going to make my cylinder go away. And I'm going to be happy with this triangle shape that I've designed that is hollowed out and ready for my LED to be embedded. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and export this. And we're going to call it something different instead of triangle this time. Let's go back into my folder and we'll call this triangle socket.obj. Okay, and now we've got that file ready to work with in our slicing program. All right, so we're ready to slice. Um, you're gonna need a slicing program. Again, there are many of these. I like Cura, it's made by Ultimaker. They make 3D printers. Um, I don't have one of their 3D printers, but uh, from what I understand, they're pretty neat. I definitely like their free software that slices files for many, many different kinds of 3D printers, and it's called Cura. Uh, if you want this, again, on Linux, you open up a terminal with Control-Alt-T. Uh, you would type sudo for root, so sudo apt-get install Cura, C-U-R-A. And again, on Linux, it will find the exact right software application for the computer you're working with and install it. I've already got it, so I'm going to pop that up. Every time it loads, it wants to ask me if I want to install updated software. I really don't, because this is the, the most recent version that works well with this operating system. I want to go ahead and load my file, which is called Triangle Socket. When it comes in here, what I want to do is, uh, in, in Cura, you're, you're going to see I can't really tell which side is up. So I'm going to go into Layers. Well, that usually, there we go. You can see the inside edge there. So this side, I'm going to orient that up so that my flat base is on the base of the print bed and it comes out really clean. So you go back to Normal View and I'm going to click over here to rotate and I'm gonna rotate my flat base portion down. It falls flat, but if it doesn't fall flat for any reason, if it's sitting up at a weird angle, you can hit this lay flat button and it will do that. Um, I'm gonna zoom out here a little bit and get a 3D angle on this. And then what I wanna do is check transparent view, which is also, in addition to layers, you can use transparent, just to make sure that I've got my flat base oriented on the bottom. And that's what I want there. So I'm gonna go ahead and print this. Um, it may not come out the right size the first time because I did not manually plug in um, exact dimensions. If I need to change my size, there is a scaling tool here in Cura. So you don't have to go back into Blender. You can scale um, in the same way we did in Blender by changing this to, you know, Two, uh, two instead of one will make it twice as big in any particular dimension. We can do the same thing to just limit it to Z and make it taller if we want to make it a little taller. Um, or instead of doing it by percentage proportions, you can actually do it in millimeters. And I like that a lot about Cura is that you can actually get your calipers out here and measure your space and bring it back here and measure your item and put it in the exact millimeter measurements that you want. Um, so I'm gonna do that so that I make sure that I've got this right. Okay, so um, I'm looking at about 30 millimeters for the sides of my triangle. I'm going to, I want my socket to be a little smaller than that because I want to keep some of the detail of the divot subset in the helm and not take up the whole space of it with my new socket. Uh, so I'm gonna go a little smaller than that on each side. As you can see here, uh, Kira is telling me, even though I reoriented the object, that my X and my Y are different and that my Z, my height axis, is equal in millimeter length to one of my sides. And that's wrong. And it's because I flipped it and dropped it and Kira still thinks it's standing upright like it was when it loaded. To fix that, in the scale thing, you just hit reset and it will figure out what orientation it's in right now <laughs> and what the actual measurements. So make sure you do that before you go to try to mess with anything. So now I've got my X and my Y at uh, 19 approximately and my, my Z is at two. Um, so I'm actually just gonna change this a little bit here you know what, 20 is okay. Let's print it at 20, about 20-ish, and see where it comes out. I may want to change this to 25, um, but let's just see if it's big enough to get my LED into um, and small enough so that it doesn't take up that whole socket. So what I want to do is grab an SD card. If you have an SD card reader, a micro SD card reader in your computer, you can just pop that right into your computer and it will load it up there. If you don't, um, your 3D printer likely came out with one of these adapters to go micro SD to USB. Slip that in. All 
Alright, I don't need to know what's in the folder at the moment. That can go away, and we'll just click save. Uh, and before we do, let's just take a minute to notice that um, I'm not using any support for this. I'm not using any platform adhesion like a raft or anything. I am printing this at 100% uh, infill density because I want it to be solid. Um, and it's only going to project one minute to print this, uh, and it's going to use 0 0.09 meters of filament, which is basically nothing. So uh, it's going to be a very small, very quick print. So I'm going to save that to my SD card. It has saved it as trianglesocket.gcode. G-code is the code that you use to tell your 3D printer how to do it. Uh, I'm going to eject and pop my card out, and we're going to move this to the 3D printer to create our file in the real world. All right, so my instincts here were, uh, were pretty on point. This is not my first rodeo. Um, I printed this first one, like I said, at about 19, 20 millimeters per side-ish. And it was a little small. Um, I like the edging, but I wanted something a little bigger, so I tried it again. And I actually also increased the uh, height, the Z-axis this time, because I really wanted to see if I could fit my LED module um, inside of this socket without cutting the heat sink that, that is attached to it. This is one of those big three watt LEDs I'm gonna use in here. It's gonna be green and it's gonna be beautiful and it's gonna be full power. Um, and this is the right size. However, I just, I'm not gonna be able to get the LED in there. It's, it's just too big and I don't wanna cut my heat sink um, because if I do, the thing will get hot and these things are made of plastic and that's just not what I want. So I actually went for the best of both, both worlds here and I printed a third option with the new uh, 25 millimeter length sizing, but with a two millimeter thin profile. And that looks pretty sick in there. Um, it'll, you'll, see, you'll be able to see it better once I get it painted up here. Uh, but what it's gonna allow me to do is put the LED behind the helmet and mount it in and uh, have it pop up through and still get some pretty cool texture profiles in there. Um, so what I want to do next is open up my hole for my LED to shine through. I want to open up my hole here for my LED to shine through. And then I'm going to get a uh, heat gun out, probably just a, uh, a hair dryer. I don't want to use a full power heat gun on this because it's pretty thin plastic and heat gun will melt it too much. And I want to warm it up enough after I've drilled my hole through it so that I can form fit it around the curve in the helm and it'll sit nicely in the socket. So that's next. Alright, I'm pretty stoked. This is looking pretty sick here. Um, I think that with that addition, we are ready to move on to electronics. So this has been the structure for Dr. Doom's Model Prime, um, and now we're going to move into part two. I hope you will join me, because we're going to do some really cool electronics for this one. We're going to work with a concept um, called Soft Robotics where the uh, heads-up display and all of the electronics, except for that light, are gonna be able to come out and be used without the helmet. And the helmet is just the hard tech on top of the soft robotics, the soft electronics. So join us next time. This is gonna be super fun.